Hi, this is Sandeep Bharti, and welcome to the next episode of TFI Newsroom. And today we have with us our old friend Frank Ashlek. You are founder of Nextcloud, and before that, you were creator of a lot of projects in the Linux desktop world. Uh, and you have been associated with the KD project for a very long time. And now, uh, as as uh, as Nextcloud, uh, you're not only uh, working on building a free software project and product. But it's also having a lot of ripples and you know uh, impact on the political landscape as well. Especially when we look at uh, sovereignty and uh, if you look at a lot of um, development that is happening, where uh, a lot of political decisions like sanctions they deprive people from accessing software. For example, a good example is GitHub, which is a kind of you know place where developers you know put, host their open source code base. But now in a lot of countries, they cannot access private repositories. I mean, something that they are running locally. So, so things are changing dramatically. So I, first of all, I want to know your opinion about, uh, as a European, uh, where you know, there's a lot of push towards uh, uh, privacy or sovereignty. So how do you look at this whole changing landscape before we talk about the, the actual point that we uh, came here to talk? Mm -hmm. Yeah, first of all, um, thanks for having me back at your show. It's really, really an honor. Um, I think it's, I'm listening, uh, watching all your, your videos all the time, and I think it's a, it's a wonderful, wonderful, interesting content you're producing. So it's great to be back, especially about this topic, which is um, really, um, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking about this for a long time. Of course, times are changing. So when I started with open source and free software, it was all about being in control of your data and your digital life. But and this was also the idea of Richard Stallman at the 80s when he started this, this movement, free software movement, being in control of your data because you have your computer on your desk or below your desk and then you have your free software on the computer and then together you're in control of everything, right? But this, I have to say, this was the, this were simple times <laughs> because nowadays we also have the network, we have the internet and we have the cloud and we have software as a service and a lot of other things. So it's all a little bit more complicated. Um, and this was actually the motivation why I started this private um, cloud project uh, 10 years ago, because I thought it's great to have like free software on your server and laptop and phone and everything, but uh, this cloud stuff, there's this cloud services out there. And it's also important to have like free software and distributed decentralized alternatives for these cloud services. This was the original idea. And to be honest, I really didn't think too much about it. I just thought, well, if everything is in control of like five big companies, that's a problem. So I want to be more decentralized. This was a pure technical <laughs> computer nerd Linux hacker perspective. Of course, these questions are now on the political stage, right? Or you have this, um, sanctions and like European politicians talking about it, American politicians talking about it as a lot of big changes happening in Russia and, and China to control data to be independent or not independent to influence other countries or not. So this is a uh, this is really heating up. So it's but it's my favorite my favorite topic I have to say. If you remember correctly early days the whole free software movement was that I want my desktop to be free. Now the desktop is free, you can run Linux as much as you want on your machine, but your data is not free. So, yeah. uh, I mean, you can, you can be running Ubuntu, log into Facebook and Google, and everything is being tracked. So it's more, you know, so just having Linux yeah. is not enough. It's more like having a well-armored Hummer car, but the keys are with someone else. <laughs> exactly. Yes. That's so, exactly the point. Yeah. 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 So, so efforts like Nextcloud, you know, and all the other efforts are going on. So people are still uh, kind of obsessed with the desktop, but the war has moved away from your local machine. You know, everything. And you. And right. the, the fact is that uh, it's a wishful mm -hmm. thinking that you can, you know, plug yourself off from the grid. But the thing is, we work in technology field. You know, so we uh, and humans, you know, uh, technology empower us. Uh, to become more efficient, to become more productive. We work in a technology field, so we cannot say no to technology. We have to find, so yeah. we have to find solutions. So yeah, instead exactly. of saying that, you know, boycott X, boycott Y, no, that is not going to work. We should be yes. a part of the solution. Yeah, so that's why Absolutely. I wanted you there 
because that is something what you are doing there with with Nextcloud and a lot of other initiatives that mm. you know uh, because Nextcloud is a platform. Yeah. I completely agree. I, I, co I couldn't agree more because I, I'm, a, I'm a nerd and a geek like forever. And I love technology. The thing is, I really love technology. I like everything that's happening and uh, devices and software and new trends and architectures and services. I really love it. And I, there are a lot of people who say, well, the solution is to disconnect, right? Or Facebook is evil and cancel Facebook or don't use the internet, or don't use your smartphone. And I mean, that's a bit of a easy, but also not very practical and not very future-proof solution, right? So I think what we as technologists, as developers should do is to basically steer the future into a right direction, but not say stop, right? That's conservative and bad. And I mean, this doesn't help, right? You can't say, oh, I want to live in the past. That's not the solution, right? We want to go into the future. I like technology, but like shaping it in the right way. That's the challenge. I'll just stick to this topic for just a few more minutes. Uh, what is the imminent threat that you see from your perspective, especially somebody who lives in Europe and, you know, who's also building solutions uh, to, to, to give me more control over my data, which I can use either for security, privacy, whatever I can use. Uh, how do you see where the world is moving and what are the main thing that you are worried about? <laughs> Well, that's a complicated question. I'm not really sure how many hours do we have to talk about it. Um, it's, it's really complicated. I mean, my original motivation, as I said at the beginning, was about centralization of data, but not only data, also centralization of like algorithm, right? You see it like from the Facebook algorithm, which is completely intransparent, but this algorithm influences like half of the people on the planet. So that's a bit of a challenge. And then um, you see this with other areas too, right? A lot of Americans are they're, they're freaked out at the moment about apps like TikTok, which come from the from China. And they're, of course, exactly the same in transparent. You don't know who, what content is prioritized and what not. And there's nothing you can do. You can't like influence it from a technology side or from a legal perspective. Or I mean, you can block it or you can not block it and that's it. So this is really, that's in transparent. But that's a challenge for like all areas and all companies and countries and people who have access to the internet. Um, yeah, and of course there is the danger from a technology perspective that the internet fragments, uh, fra fragmentates. So, um, I mean, we all saw the news about um, that Russia basically has new laws now where they're trying to be independent from the US. And also China is doing this for a long time with the, the Great Firewall of China, of course, and they, they decide what content goes through and what content doesn't go through. And um, this is a bit of a danger that the internet, which is the network of which spans the whole planet, is like fragmenting and fragmented, um, yeah, fragmenting. And the same is for Europe, right? And for Europe, there's a lot of discussion about digital serenity, that we should be independent. And that's a bit of a tricky situation for me. I'm not really sure what to say, because on one hand, I really want to decentralize services. I think it should, it would be good if Europe would have like just their own services for, for a few things. If there would be an alternative to Google, alternative to Facebook, alternative to Microsoft, but not in a, not in a way to cut, cut us off from the rest of the internet. At, at some point, every country has their own internet. That's of course stupid, but just I think there should be alternatives, decentralized alternatives. Uh, let's let's now talk about uh, this European effort, uh, which is kind of uh, Germany and France governments are working on building. It's called Gaia X or Gia X. I don't know how it's pronounced. Gaia, Gaia, Gaia X. So, yeah, exactly. yeah. So, what exactly is it? <laughs> so, um, so first of all, I'm um, I'm a bit involved in this in this project. But this doesn't mean a lot. That's why we have you. That's that's why we have you on the show. There is a reason I approach you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So okay, I mean, of course, I'm a bit involved. I'm talking with politicians and other and technology uh, companies and so on. But this doesn't mean that I fully understand it, <laughs> because it is a huge project where basically a ton of people have opinions and trying to come together. And the idea is, I think, the overall idea is to. Um, have like cloud services, um, alternative to Amazon and, 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 and Google, uh, Google Cloud and Microsoft Azure to have an alternative for that. But the idea is not to build like 
some kind of state-funded big company in Europe as alternative, that would fail, that would be a stupid idea. But the idea is more to bring like one of some of the smaller um, cloud companies and service providers together and with some shared standards and shared protocols make them interoperable and then basically you have this federated cloud of whatever 10, 20 different cloud providers and together there can be an alternative to the big uh, hyperscalers like like Amazon. That's that's the idea and that this is like this initiative came comes from the um, from the politicians, um, not from the industry. So it's their idea to do this. And of course, I don't know how it is in the US, but in Europe there are also a lot of projects like that that fail. So from my perspective, it's not really clear yet um, if this is going to work, especially we have so many people with opinions in that. Um, but I have to say, I, I think I like, I like the general idea that, um, that people want to invest in like alternatives. Of course, I would be totally against it, that it would somehow have isolist, isolatistic uh, um, tendencies that you somehow want to cut off or block services as China or Russia does do it. I think that's stupid. But having an alternative distributed, federated and also based on open source, by the way, free software, I think it's in general not a bad idea. Uh, if you go back to Gaia uh, X, uh, as you said, you know, in European, a lot of efforts were there, uh, like Munich is a good example. Uh, there are a lot of ambitious effects, uh, efforts are there, but they fail. And there are a lot of reasons for failure. Uh, because, mm. you know, as you rightly said, that people have opinion. Politicians sometimes don't work with te technologies to basically actually understand. It's not like, yeah. you know, lift and shift. It has a lot of processes involved there. Yeah. Uh, so when you look at GAIA-X, first of all, uh, what is your opinion? You did share some thoughts about it, but uh, it's a complex and it's very early days. But uh, the, the basic idea is to build a local cloud in Europe or to facilitate? What, what is the basic idea behind GAIA-X? So the idea is um, to have some standards and APIs and requirements, um, like a, basically have a consortium, consortium of companies where we have certain rules and standards and so on. Um, and um, uh, big uh, cloud providers in Europe can become part of this group and then they follow the same standards and the same, um, the same rules and the same APIs. And then they're part of this meta cloud in a way. Right? And it's not the idea to build like one big cloud company. This is, would not work, especially not if it's pushed by the government. It needs to be a private initiative, I think. But the idea is to bring basically different players together and say, look, uh, together we can be interoperable. So the idea is that a customer, if you have a company here and wants to buy some cloud services, they can still buy it from Amazon or Microsoft or Google or whatever, but maybe there's also an offering on, on, uh, on uh, from Gaia X, and then you can go to website and you say, okay, I have these requirements, I need these services, I want to have this protection and this pricing, and then want to have the data close to this area and whatever, and then you get these services and they're provided by different companies in the background. So you have that federated system and then some kind of system detects like, well, I mean, this company should then use like 10% of the resources from this Spanish cloud provider and 30% from this Norwegian one and other ones from, from Italy or whatever. And then you have similar services than what you get from Amazon, but in a distributed local way. But there are also requirements that you can switch then away because they're all no longer happy with the machine learning services from this, whatever, France company. I want to move my machine learning services to another service provider in Denmark or something. So it's transparent and interoperable. So the basic idea here is um, to, to kind of open up the cloud in a manner that local companies uh, should be able to plug into, whether it's AWS or Azure, and offer you know services where you can uh, pick and choose the components that you want. Maybe you want to run an ML and AI framework for somewhere else. You want to run somewhere else so you can mix and match. And there is more kind of, you know, uh, room for European companies also to compete because, you know, the pricing of AWS is so aggressive or, you know, that it's kind of monopoly in some cases. That is the basic idea, right? Yeah, that's the basic idea to mob, um, provide, um, build some kind of ecosystem market-based thing 
then can then uh, be competitive. But again, it's very early, right? I mean, mm -hmm. the project was announced like literally two weeks ago right. um, in, the, in the event here. And it's also at the moment, it's also still a German initiative. But the thing is that um, the German um, ministries, they have kind of a approval from the rest of, the, of Europe to basically be the first, first mover. And once this is like going to the right direction, then the rest of Europe will join. So that's the basic idea. But it's very early. So let's see, uh, let's see how it goes. If you look at Europe uh, or Germany especially, what kind of uh, public cloud, cloud providers are there? I am aware of that a lot of like, you know, I, do, I think it's called DTK or T-Mobile that is called in the US. They have built T-Systems. A lot of other European companies have built a lot of their cloud using OpenStack. So can you talk about mm -hmm. what kind of cloud companies are there in Europe who are kind yeah, of, you know, yeah. interested in? Well, they're actually, they're actually um, um, some of them. I mean, you mentioned the German Telecom which owns uh, T-Mobile in the US. So that's a quite big international um, organization. Um, and there are other than Telefonica from Spain and Vodafone. And um, even in Germany, there's like Eins and Eins, Jonas. And there are, there are some of them. And they're all not small. They're definitely big. I mean, they're not gigantic like Amazon and Google. But they're like serious companies with like hundreds of thousands of employees and many, many billions of revenue. So that definitely something. Mm -hmm. Of course, yeah. at the moment they're competing with each other. That's the interesting part, mm -hmm. right? They're competing, and now the the politicians there go to them and say, "Hey, why don't you work together?" So right. um, yeah, let's see how yeah. this works out. Yeah, if you look at China, Beidou, Tencent, you know, Alibaba, you know, they're called bad companies. You know, uh, they they totally mm -hmm. dominate the, and they're actually those companies are contributing a lot to open source actually. They're using a lot of open source and they're, I was in China, yeah. Shanghai and met a lot of them and they're doing entry level jobs. So that can be done in Europe as well. Uh, yeah. So uh, sometimes people confuse uh, Nextcloud with a public cloud offering. Yeah. <laughs> Nextcloud is not open stack, you know. So what yeah. role would Nextcloud play in the, or, or, or what impact Gaia X will have on Nextcloud? So before we go there, let's, let's mm -hmm. like settle this question, you know, Nextcloud. What is Nextcloud? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So first of all, Nextcloud is not infrastructure. So because, I mean, you have a software stack, right? You have like cables and servers, the hardware, low level, and then you have like operating systems, typically Linux, and then you have like uh, middleware components like, uh, like OpenStack or Kubernetes and other things, uh, Ceph or storage and so on. Um, and this all is like in the infrastructure level. It provides all kinds of infrastructure services. Um, and Nextcloud is on top of that. So Nextcloud is the application layer. So we uh, provide like files you can share and chatting and email and calendar and contacts and yeah, video calling and project management, all kinds of services. You can, you can think about it something like Office 365. I look at it more or less like, you know, privately owned SaaS platform where you run, you know, software as a service, you know, so whether it's a file sync and share, as you mentioned, where it's document editing as you share, of course, photo editing, yeah. and then you have chatting, we have video conferences. So I'm looking at the whole suite of software right. as a service that you own. You run it as a yes. service, but you own the yeah. whole platform. Now, of course, exactly. it is not a cloud, you know, where you are not provisioning the yes. <laughs> nodes. You are still running exactly. on top of OpenStack. You know, you can run on top of OpenStack, right. you know, and make it federated everywhere. Yep. Am I right? Exactly. That's the second difference. So first mm -hmm. of all, we are, on, we are on top of the stack. We are not doing infrastructure. And the second main difference is, of course, that we, don't, we are not a SaaS solution. We are not a cloud service, right? We are a software vendor. We are actually a very boring, old-school software vendor. Um, and we give the software to our users, the home users and the companies and the governments and so on. And there, as, exactly as you said, they can take the software, put it on top of OpenStack or some other infrastructure, and then they have their own service similar to G Suite or Office 365. Yeah. So now we understand what is NetCloud. What, what does Gaia X mean for, mm. for you? What role are you playing in this the, the, yeah. Uh, project? Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, Gaia X focuses on the infrastructure side. So um, Gaia X competes with uh, Microsoft Azure and uh, Google, Cl uh, Google Cloud and uh, AWS. So the infrastructure layer. Um, of course, who wants infrastructure, right? <laughs> what you really want is an application that runs on top of the infrastructure and together then you have something that's useful for your business. 
Um, so um, what companies actually want is the, in, the combination of infrastructure services and then the application like Nextcloud on top of it. And this is why the Gaia X project is very interesting for us. Because if there would be uh, um, an easy way to get cloud infrastructure in a complete GDPR compliant way, in a, in a, in a fair way, very local, very affordable, nice competition and so on, and this would be super easy purchable, uh, 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 yeah, viable from all companies in, in Europe, then they can, be, they can run Nextcloud on top of it. And then they have their own Office 365, basically, and being in control of their data and so on. So this is why this is very interesting. So basically, we are, they, they, are, they are building the road, roads. We have the cars, and we are really happy that there are more roads so that we can, have, we can use our cars better. Right. This is the way. <clears throat> And the car kind of car that you're building is called, so I mean, I, that's not a right term these days, but it's more or less <laughs> like Lyft and Uber also, because you, uh, people literally, you know, they don't have to own the cars because Nextcloud is something that you don't have to install it. There are a lot of providers yes. that you work with that can offer, and you can work with, I, I think, their French company like Gandhi, which all yeah. support a lot of, you know, yeah. privacy. So, so you can, because uh, when you run your, I mean, even if you are not managing it, you do have more leeway and freedom than going to a pure public, you know, uh, you know, SaaS solution because they monitor your content, they censor your content. You are bound by their terms and conditions. What kind of content you can put on it? So even if you're running Nextcloud on someone else's server, you still have much more freedom and control. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so this is the thing is with Nextcloud. It is. Um, you can do a lot of different things with it. I mean, you can just take a Raspberry Pi at home, put Nextcloud in it, and run it for your family at home. That's possible. I actually, I always use this example. I would never really recommend it because a <laughs> Raspberry Pi has no real, I mean, there's no real redundant storage and nothing, right? But it's possible. Some people actually do it. Yeah, you can do anything. You can run, yeah, you can then run it on a, on a proper Linux machine, on a, on a cluster, um, in your hosting center, or as a service provider. You can do that. But sometimes you don't want to run your own software. And then you can go, as you mentioned, to one of the service providers that we work with. You can, they are like, that's the difference to, to uh, Microsoft or, um, Office 365, for example. That's only available for Microsoft, right? You can go to Microsoft, buy it or not buy it. It's the only choice you have. But Nextcloud, you can actually buy from 100 different service providers. You can pick them based on price and location and terms of service and, and, and service level agreements, all kinds of different things. And you pick the right one and then you use them. And if you're no longer happy, you can move to another one and still use Nextcloud. So that's the freedom you, you, you get from Nextcloud. Yeah, because to me, what is important is my data. I don't really care about the app and service, you know. Yes, I yeah. use the app and service to access and process data. And I think yeah. with, uh, with Nextcloud, the beauty is also that you can move from provider to provider also. You, you're you not tied to one. You will not lose data. You don't have to yeah. worry about, hey, you know, everything is logged into Office 360. I cannot move to Google or whatever. Uh, yes. So, so yeah. That. Now, if you look at, if you just draw a, a very parallel comparison between Office 365 and Nextcloud, where do you mm -hmm. stand today? Because you are comparatively, comparatively newer and smaller compared to them. So mm -hmm. uh, feature-wise, or we, we talked about some of the advantages that people have of, by using Nextcloud. You know, you have more control. Yeah. Some people don't want control. They just, you know, some people don't, you know, really care. They just want uh, yeah. uh, convenience, and that is right too. I want convenience too. So can you just Absolutely. give some, yeah, from from feature-wise? So um, yeah, yeah. There's, uh, there are a lot of benefits from from Nextcloud in this area. So of course. I don't want to mention the privacy and security and control anymore. You need to ask about the productivity itself. And actually, Nextcloud is very competitive and sometimes even better there. So, I mean, there is like um, the files you can share part. We have very powerful tagging and full text search and retention and actually a lot of functionality that's not available in, in OneDrive. So we actually have, might be a surprise to some of some of your listeners, but we actually the, the OneDrive functionality, the, the, the drive functionality is actually a lot more advanced than what you get from OneDrive. And then another benefit is, of course, that Nextcloud is fully cross-platform. I mean, of course, we support iOS and Android, we are as Microsoft, but for, we really also support a Linux desktop. I mean, of course, the Linux desktop is not super popular, but we have it's fully supported. We have clients for it. You can, in Nautilus or Dolphin, KDE, GNOME, right-click on a file and create a share link and so on. It's it's really in the same level, um, and you don't get this from uh, from the others. 
I think Dropbox, they even they had the support for Linux, I think, and they screwed it up. So um, yeah, so we are really cross-platform. That's an advantage. Another thing is that all the different components, calendar, chat, uh, syncing, editing, it, they're really nicely integrated. So I don't look at what others are doing too much, but um, like uh, two months ago, I actually had to use Office 365 because of an um, external project. I could not avoid it, so I actually used it. And I was surprised how, how bad it is. So um, they have this, like uh, under, in the top menu, you have this kind of start menu. And, and if you're in the files view, OneDrive view, it, you click on it and then you click on Word and then a new tab opens, right? It's not in the same interface. There's a new browser tab, and then and then the top bar of course looks completely different. And then click it again, and you click on Skype or something, Skype for Business, and then an, another tab opens, and it, again it looks completely different. And then at the end of the day, you have like 10, 20 tabs open, and it's not doesn't really feel like one software. So I was actually surprised how how bad it is. So this is all very nicely integrated in in Nextcloud. As we established, you know that privacy security is the strength of Nextcloud, yeah. but a lot of people they don't care about it. People who yeah. are who may be watching this on on, on you know, Facebook certainly don't care about privacy and <laughs> um, so, but they care about uh, features, functionality, convenience. So, yeah. and I want to highlight that aspect because that is also one of your strengths. So, why mm -hmm. we should not talk about that? Because you know, sometimes I just want to. Uh, go to a restaurant, eat food. I really don't care about you know what is their hiring practices, what is their PR, <laughs> you know. So <laughs> yeah, of course, of course, I know what yeah. you mean. Same for me. Yeah. Same for me. Yeah. So I, I completely agree. It's not enough to be have software that's open source and secure and everything, which is great. But a lot of people don't care. It also needs to be great software. Yeah, like I mean, it's it's important that it's yeah, yeah, it's important yeah. to have those things in place, but. On top of the, on top of that, we should have all these convenience, everything. Uh, yeah. I mean, I'm not saying that you know uh, this versus this. I'm saying that okay, uh, the stack is you know is, is ethically created. It is it, respect to privacy and security if you want. But can you do what you want to do on that? You know that yeah. is to me that is more important because of course, yeah, absolutely. And because that's very important, there's so many open source projects that are technically uh, great, but so hard to use. And that's a blocker. And a lot of developers don't really understand that they don't write software for themselves because they're usually advanced users. That you should write software for the rest of the world, which appreciates like something that's easy to use and easy to understand. And you don't need to, whatever, study the software for a year until you can do something. So I completely yeah, uh agree. Yeah, so there are two things there. One is that, you know, as you rightly said, developers, they're advanced users, so they can, you know, go around things and do things. Second is sometimes they say, I don't care, you know, it doesn't matter to me, but it may matter to someone else. Like, you know, yeah. I'm more than happy to give my data to Google Maps, but that also means that I'm when I'm rushing to hospital, or I'm going to pick my son, it will give me the fastest route, you know? Yeah. it will. So, so there's always a trade, I always talking to somebody, uh, I think uh, it was uh, uh, one of the creators of the, some uh, edge-based computing project, and they were like, uh, I'm willing to trade that information in return of getting quicker access because that is the trade-off I'm willing to make. Mm -hmm. Because without that, I'll be just fumbling and I may end up spending 30 more minutes. I may not even yeah. know, which is the nearest hospital, which is right now open. I totally so, agree. So, so I so think it's, yeah. it's my, 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 my vision is like, to have the choice, right? I'm not saying, I, I'm not advocating that I want to be completely disconnected from the internet. No, no one should know anything about me. I want to live in a cave, no technology, right? I mean, that's not the future. But then on the other side of the spectrum is, of course, there's like one vendor which knows everything. You can't move away. There's no alternative. There is like, you can innovate if it's one big company that controls everything. What I want is something in between. Right? It's like, I mean, I like technology, but I want to have different choices. I mean, it's like if you tell someone, hey, do you, um, do you like um, water? Yeah, I like water. Well, I think there's exactly one company on the whole planet that, sell, tells, uh, that sells you water and, and it doesn't have any competition, the, the, the price is high, and then you don't know where the weather comes from, but you have no choice. Do you want to drink? Sure, then you have to buy from them. 
that's bad, right? But the alternative to have no water is also bad. But why not have something in between where you have different vendors and competition and different kinds of waters and you can buy cheap water, expensive water, whatever, right? You have choice, right? It's, a, it's an open society. I mean, this is what I want. And this should also be there for cloud services and for software. Yeah, uh, I, I agree with you. And I would just like to add that it's not just about one company which controls water, but what I the way I look at it is that if, let's say, if a company like Nextcloud kind of becomes as big and successful as, uh, let's just say Office 365, or let's say if somebody, I mean, of course, OpenStreetMap is there, but if somebody is building a, a Google Map-like solution, but now, mm -hmm. because your 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 uh, the, your foundation is doing things more ethically and giving users more control, that map will have feature where I can not only disable, you know, the geotagging mm -hmm. or logging, so I want to use it, but you may also give me the freedom to 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 stop you from tracking. So, uh, as you said, it's, it's uh, why not something in middle? So as more and more companies, so it's not about. Uh, either do it at all or don't do it at all you know yeah. we should you know we should kind of you know have more and more companies like nextcloud where users you know while you get the same convenience you get the same features same functionality but on top of that when you want you can have that feature like in our toolbox there is one tool that we use only once a year Mm. But, you know, we don't use every day, but we use it maybe once a year. Like we go to vote only once, you know, every four or five years, you know, but that yeah. shapes, we don't do it every day. So sometimes that one thing is critical. It should be there. So that's yeah. how I look at next law, you know, that the foundation is strong on top of that, all the convenience and everything is there. Totally. Yeah. Totally. And this is something that comes with open source. I know that a lot of people is like, yeah, open source, boring, license is boring. I don't care. I don't care. Fair enough. Right. It's like a complicated topic and you shouldn't care but it is sort of important because as you said i i mean if if next cloud becomes huge at some point and i hope so <laughs> i'm not sure but um if you have like i don't whatever it's become a gigantic company and everybody in the in the planet using next cloud this actually would not be a problem because next cloud is always open source it has to be no one can change it which means you can look into the software and if we are doing a bad job Someone can take the software and change it and modify it and do it, make it better. If we don't make it better, you can make it better yourself, or you can found a new company that makes it better. So this is this, this open foundation that you mentioned. Um, this is so there will there can never be a vendor login or dependency on Nextcloud because it is open. And it's like a lot of people don't care about open, yeah, whatever. But it is for society. I think it's it makes a difference. Yeah, because it's, when you talk about open, it's not just about the open code, it's also about how you're governing the code. And I think when Nextcloud was found, you did separate, you know, the code from a lot of things where, you know, Nextcloud as a company will not have any control or influence there. So Exactly. exactly. You, you, yeah. Uh, and uh, actually, a lot of companies nowadays, you know, almost every company that I meet, because I, you know, specialize in open, enterprise open source, they're all doing open source. The only problem is they don't know open source as well as you do, you know, <laughs> and they sometimes they face challenges because they embrace open source, but they don't operate as an open source company. And the problem is education, you know, it's, it's not their fault. They have been running their shop as a proprietary yeah, yeah. company. So there's a lot of, you know, educational um, Totally. So, yeah, I think I think we we covered the Gaia part a lot. We talked about you know what Nextcloud is doing. Anything else you would like to touch upon in today's discussion? That hey, Swapnil, this is something I want to talk about. <laughs> no, this is a super super interesting discussion. I could talk for for more hours and hours, but I think we we covered uh, covered most of it. I'm really I'm I'm really looking forward. I really look forward how the world evolves, what's happening next. I mean, I think actually the lot the discussions that happen at the moment are very healthy. If like do company uh, countries want to be independent or not, or do you want to be, uh, rely on others? Of course, you have to rely on other, others, but how much and who has control of the data, data protection legislation? I actually, as I mentioned before, I find it even interesting that the discussion even pops up in the US with the, the TikTok discussion, where like for a long time, 
I think people in the US didn't really understand um, what the problem of Europe is with like foreign cloud services. And I find it a bit ironic that like people in the US are suddenly like, I think there's even a hearing in, the, in Congress now where people say, okay, who has access to my data? Who can influence our elections and so on? So suddenly the topic is hot. <laughs> so I find it interesting. I think discussions are great. So I'm, I'm looking forward how the, the world changes, hopefully to the better. Uh, my only issue is that, uh unlike Europe, uh, US uh, people really don't have that mindset of privacy and you know, those spaces. Yeah. Here I have seen people go to uh, uh, stores, retail stores, and they're willing to fill a form with their home address, phone number, email address to get 1% discount so that they can get a card and they get discount. So now every time you go and buy, the store knows what you bought. You know, yeah. so so uh, so I so these discussions happen because you know we have corporate media which you know sells this stuff just the way we sell fast food. It will become a hot topic, get them a lot of views for a while, and then people will go back to uh, shopping from Amazon and and watching things on Netflix and logging to Facebook. So and they will have all these discussions on Facebook chats <laughs> about <laughs> privacy. I know. So I but, uh, I'm, not, I'm, but I'm, I'm still not optimistic. optimistic. I'm not You're hopeful. Not hopeful. Uh, I'm optimistic. Uh, I'm all. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, from the U.S. point of view, I'm not because the thing is, um, uh, uh. some of the 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 media companies are also owned by ISPs and ISVs, the the same people, you know. So the thing yeah. is that it's really hard uh, to to fight the cause when you are the problem, you know. So uh, I I really because sure. uh, it, so I really don't see that's going to change here in Europe and other countries things are different so things will change there here yeah. I am not very hopeful we'll see because the thing is that government want access to I mean just the kind of treasure trove Facebook has created nobody wants to give it up even 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 the same politicians who are against it they also run Facebook campaigns to reach out to their constituents. Because mm. nobody, uh, nobody more than Facebook tells them more about who Swapnil Bharatiya is because they know that he's democratic or blue leaning or red leaning. So approach him. So, so the thing is that even if they, they want it to, to be controlled, they want it because they also know this, this is their own platform too. So how are mm. you going to shoot yourself in the foot? I don't think that is happening. There will be a lot of buzz around it so that you can, you know, get people angry and then people move and people think that, hey, something is happening. Nothing will happen. That is my projection. We'll see. We'll, <laughs> you, have we'll be, see. You, have more, you have to be more optimistic. No, I'm, I mean, I'm, the, all, I, the, I'm also a science fiction writer and most of the science fiction is not optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. That's true. That's true. But yeah. So, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't want to touch uh, politics and especially not U.S. politics, but I mean, I know that there are some candidates who aren't actually want to break up big corporations and have more competition and so on. I'm not saying it's a good thing. I don't know. I don't know not enough about it. But I think there is some discussion that the current situation might not be optimal. So, mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know what happens. Right. Okay, Frank, thank you so much for explaining GaiaX and also just to give us perspective about uh, what, what is going on in Europe in terms of cloud. I think this is really important, especially with the changing political landscape these days. Uh, so uh, though the, the, the primary goal of GaiaX is not to become sovereign, it's more to create a even playing field for European uh, yeah. uh, uh, cloud providers. Right. But, you know, but, you know, at least some effort is going on there. Uh, to yeah. decentralize it in a, in a uh, not decentralized but actually more interoperable so that people can plug and play whatever uh, services they need in their cloud so That's so true. thank you frank once again and i look forward to seeing you in person at some point absolutely thanks a lot and uh, have a good day you too bye, -bye. bye.